Today, we are kicking off a brand new series simply titled, say it with me, it's on the screen, Jesus is. Good job, y'all. You are right there with me. We're going to be studying for the next few weeks and really diving into who Jesus really is, taking us all the way to Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate our Lord Jesus and his, not only his sacrifice, his death, burial, but how many of y'all know he came out of that grave, right? And so that's coming in just a few weeks. If you'd like to grab some invitations to invite a friend to that, I want to encourage you to do that in this season. We're going to go straight to God's word. Here's something that Jesus said that I think is really important to us. It's going to be on every screen if you're with me. Let's read along. John chapter 14 verse 1 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. I love this about Jesus. He's gone ahead of us. He's the first of us. And he's building a great mansion. How many of y'all got a room there, right? I'm looking forward to God preparing a place. And well, then Thomas responds to Jesus right there in the middle of the passage. He, he, Jesus says, you know the place, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Ever been there, right? Don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Every one of us has been lost somewhere in the process, if we're honest whether it's your first time coming to church here or your first time on a college campus or first time in a new city, when you show up, we all get lost a couple of times. Can I just confess to you guys that my wife is geographically challenged, okay? And, and so I told her, I said, listen, in New Orleans, you just drive till you run into water, okay? Some of y'all aren't from here. You drive till you run into water, and then you know where you are. If you had Lake Pontchartrain, you know you went north. Anyway, just, just to make it easy, but... We love doubting Thomas, that's what we've referred to him all these years now, because Thomas was always willing to ask the question that others thought maybe I shouldn't say, or if I asked the question, they would think that I, that was kind of a dumb question, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But we love Thomas because he was willing to reach out. And today I would say that all of us have questions about life and creation and faith, and instead of going around it, maybe we ought to lean in and see what Jesus would say. I want you to read with me aloud, every voice, Bell Chase, Paris Avenue, John 14, 6. Here's Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. i got to tell you guys, the earlier service just killed y'all on that one. <laughs> Jesus responds with simply saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas says, I don't know which way to go, and I don't know where you're going. Jesus said, I am the way. Follow me and do what I do. Now, historically, we've railed on doubting Thomas for his doubt, but I want you to know that in this season, for the next few weeks, this verse is going to be our outline to get our answers. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, we believe that Jesus is the way. Now, if you're here today and you like friend invited you and kind of like the music, enjoy the environment, feels nice, but I'm still on the fence about Jesus. Today, I would tell you this is a safe place to ask questions, to learn, to grow. No one's going to judge you as you discover and learn about faith. We're going to help you along the way. But just to make it clear today so that there's no doubt where I am because I am not a doubting Thomas. Amen, everybody. I believe that Jesus is the way. Anyone here, I don't know if this is uh, your kind of, you know, the movies you like to watch. Anybody here a Star Wars fan? Anybody, anybody? Show me, show me those hands. Some of y'all be bold. Some of y'all don't want to raise your hands right now because you don't want to be embarrassed. But um, very early on as a child, my dad introduced us to the first Star Wars movie. And I was just enamored and fell in love with the movies. And later as I grown up, I realized it was because of Princess Leia, everybody, okay? <laughs> I had a little bit of a girl crush going on there and so fell in love with the movies if you watched any of them there's the the saga and the history and span generations but here recently there has been a spinoff from a main character anybody seen the mandalorian the mandalorian anybody anybody yeah so a few some of y'all like the same ones who raised your hands earlier and those of you who are not fans are still not fans i'm sorry i will pray for you 
The Mandalorian has this line in every one of his episodes that whenever things get hard, whenever things are overwhelming, when I don't know what to do, he says just a few words. He stops himself and says, this is the way. Whenever it feels overwhelming, whenever I don't know what to do, when I don't know what's next, if Star Wars can figure out, how much can we do it, right? How, how much better can we be to realize that when you don't know where to go, when you don't know what you should say, we would say Jesus is, come on, say, Jesus is the way. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4 that Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. We believe that Jesus is the way to the life that you're hoping for. And the Bible tells us that he's the cornerstone. The cornerstone, if you're unfamiliar in building days, they would always set the cornerstones because that was the measuring for everything else. That would tell us where we would begin and where we would end if you're a little bit younger, you would look at puzzle pieces. And what do you do when you're building a puzzle? You build the corners and the edges all the way around. And then everything else fits inside of those edges. Jesus is the boundary. Jesus is the life. He is the cornerstone that everything else fits in. Your puzzle piece fits inside of the boundaries of who Jesus is. Now, some of you guys are newer to One Hope Church, and I just want to help you to realize, I know some of you are lacking an hour of sleep, all of us are lacking an hour of sleep, but if you say amen, preach it, I preach better and I preach shorter. Amen, everybody? All right, this side of the room's with me, the rest of y'all is going to be long, okay? Everyone wants to know which direction to go in life, but when you know his way, it becomes easier to find your way. You find yourself inside the boundaries of the cornerstone. So Jesus said this in John chapter 6, 29. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. What's the only work? Believe in the one he has sent. Jesus said, and he understood that his role was to lead the way for us, that his role was to be the boundaries of our life. He, his life was to be the way that we should mimic and we should follow. And if you've been following Christ, this isn't a new idea because Christianity isn't hard to understand. It's hard to do. I don't know about you. Being like Jesus is easy when I'm around people that I like, right? It's only hard when the Bible says, love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's not hard to understand. I just don't want to do it. How about y'all? Thank you for the four of you who laugh right there. Don't take me too serious. It's true. All of us have these moments where you're like, like when the person's in the left lane and they won't move over and they're driving below the speed limit. I need Jesus in those moments. Just trying to, trying to help some of y'all out. My friend says it this way, uh, the people who drive fast in the left lane, they have ticket money. They all, that's what they have. They have ticket money. So, Based on these verses that I just read you today and the clear focus on Jesus, some people respond to those verses and they say, that's my problem with Christianity. It's so exclusive. It's, it's only about Jesus and it excludes all these others. The reality is, all religions today are exclusive. The people around you have said, well, I just believe all roads lead to the same place. That mentality is rejected by every single religion in the world. There isn't a single one that says that works out. Many religions don't even agree that there is a God, and the term God is almost used generically in some environments. Because... But Christianity is actually very inclusive compared to other religions. And personally, I don't even like to refer to Christianity as a religion. Because religion is man's attempt to get to God. Write that down. They're going to put it on screen right now for you. Religion is mankind's attempt to get to God. This verse, this song doesn't really fit there, but religion is just work, 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 work. Right? It's, just, it's like trying to do it all on my own. 
But Jesus, Jesus is God's attempt to save mankind. There's an incredible difference between the two because religion is trying to do it on their own. Just like Islam says that good deeds need to weigh out your bad deeds so that you can get to paradise. And their ultimate good deed is martyrdom. You can see how that living that way stacks you in a direction that leads you to do some of the most ungodly things. How about Hinduism that says that that life is all about karma. You're living this endless cycle of hoping I can do enough good things finally so the next time I come back, I won't be a snail. Can I just tell you guys today, the Bible is very, very clear. The Bible says that he who began a good work is faithful to complete the work. We are not on some endless cycle of randomness. God is doing something, and God will finish what he is doing. Amen, everybody? He is living up. So we trust him. We see that there is a difference in what he is and what the world says. We've got to break the cycle of our lives of kind of falling into all the world religions equaling Christianity. It's not true. Christianity is not a religion. Religion is man's attempt to get to God, but Christianity is Jesus. It's Jesus showing us that God is reaching out to every one of us. The more you lean into this, the better your relationship with God would be because you realize you don't have to do what you've always seen. You can actually lean in. And do it the way Jesus did. That's why Christianity is so focused, so narrowly focused on Jesus. In Christianity, you don't have to do anything at first. You just have to receive someone who did it all for you. You can't work your way into getting God. You don't have to get it right to get to God. You get to God so that you can get it right. Religion really doesn't work. It never has. And I want to give you five reasons why it doesn't. Write them down with me. Here's the first. Religion doesn't work because it's hypocritical. At the very basis, religion is hypocritical because it's work, works based. So it's such a heavy lift. So the only thing you can do is fake it. They break out the rule book. How many of you have heard that? I don't go to church because of, because of that rule book. Do you realize that when God originally wrote the rules, he only had 10. That's not a lot as far as I'm concerned. Listen, your iPhone has more rules to it. Jesus showed up in the New Testament and said, if you think 10 is too many, let me just give you two. Love God and love people. If you truly love God, I don't have to tell you not to steal. If you truly love people, I don't have to tell you not to commit adultery. If you truly love them, everything would be summed up in two ideas. But because religion is about gaining control... There's a hefty rule book whereby you need religion in order to succeed. Today, I want you to know that we do not want to live a hypocritical life. Amen, everybody? And I don't want to fake it till I make it. I want real people to be around a real Jesus following following and living a real life. The second reason religion doesn't work is because it's become irrelevant to our lives. I just got to pick a little bit. Can I do that? Can I be honest with you guys? Can I just pick a little bit? Like, I'm all for, like, reading the old stories of the Old Testament, but I'm grateful I don't have to wear robes in church. Amen, everybody. I've even given up the suit and tie. Are y'all okay with that? When I was a youth pastor, I used to have to wear a suit and tie. We would go to our our pastor. I'm like, every kid looked cool, and I was like the one guy. And it was back in the baggy suit days. Y'all remember the baggy suit days? Come on, you could fit two of you in one leg. Praise God, we're not irrelevant any longer, right? I think about Jesus in his day and and how that they would speak in amphitheaters and they had to build spaces so that you could hear their voices. I love that we got lights and sound. I like feeling the bass. How about you? Religion is hypocritical because it, it teaches you to work your way there. You can't do it, so you have to fake it in order to make it. Religion is irrelevant. It's stuck in the past because of its hierarchical setup. It's got this hierarchy of leadership that's out of touch with real life. Religion, number three, doesn't work because it's just not enjoyable. I'll tell you, uh, to be around hypocritical, irrelevant people is never going to be fun. Can I get an amen from somebody, right? When you realize that we're just faking it and pretending, it's not going to be enjoyable. 
But this is what most of our experiences have been in places. We, we found, we, we've run into more religious people than people like Jesus. I don't know about you. I don't want to be hypocritical. I definitely don't want to be irrelevant. And I, there's not a single day that I want to be around unenjoyable, an unenjoyable environment. I like people who like to laugh and tell jokes. And I like people who got a little sarcasm in church. Come on now. The fourth area is why religion doesn't work is because it, it's rejecting in its very culture. Rejecting uh, uh, us for who we are or where we've come from. Religion in its very nature is pitting us against them. That's why you have all black churches and all white churches and all brown churches because the very culture of these environments. Or we have an all Republican church and an all liberal church and all Democrat church. Why do we do that? Because it creates an environment that's us against them. And it's better if I just get to hang out with everybody that looks like me. Can I keep on going here? Y'all are getting quiet like this is a Methodist church right now. <laughs> Can I just say that we reject the idea of rejecting people based upon their skin color or their background, regardless of your history, your heritage, or the color of your skin. This is a house of God, and we're going to reflect heaven. Amen, everybody. This is who we're called to be. But religion pits us against because we have differing ideas or come from differing backgrounds. Well, then we can't do this together. Listen, that is not true. We can do this together. Matter of fact, we're better when we get around people that are not like us because we learn to, and we understand and we get, to, we get to grow in our relationship with God. The last reason religion doesn't work, right, down me is because religion by itself is just weak. That's why it has to create a control mechanism because in and of itself, it can't do any of the things that God intended for you to have in your life. Religion doesn't do miracles. God does. Religion doesn't change lives. Jesus does. You say, well, Pastor, I, I thought where they were one and the same. No, no, no. After this message, you're going to know their difference. Religion is a box that is carrying a heavy load that you've got to put on your back and you've got to figure it out. It's, religion is someone else's relationship with God and them telling you if you do this, you can have a relationship like me. What I'm trying to do here today is not tell you to do what I do, but to do what the Bible actually says and to follow Jesus. Religion built on the previous four and five points will always be weak. Jesus is the opposite of religion. In Hebrews chapter 10 and 20, here's what he says. He says, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. What did he do? He opened up a life-giving way. If you've been coming to One Hope Church for any amount of time, what do I always say? How do you define life-giving? What do I say? Well, do you know what life-sucking is, right, everyone? Trying to make sure you get the vision today. Our goal is for church not to be life-sucking. If you've ever gone somewhere and felt like they were taking everything from you, that is religion. It's not to say that God will never ask you to sacrifice. It's not to say that God will never challenge you to grow or to do something hard. I'm not saying that whatsoever. But I am saying when you do the thing that God has called you to do and you do it Jesus' way, what you discover is there is life in the middle of it. I like to say it this way, so many people want to see the works of God, but so few people want to do it the way he did it. I want miracles. How about you? I want blessing. How about you? I want life change. How are you? You're not, go you're not going to get those things by doing it in a religious way. You've got to do it the way Jesus did it. This is actually my story. Whether it was my parents' intentions, I think they were honestly pursuing God, or it was their, their heartfelt uh, pursuit of God, but for whatever reason, as a young person, church just was religion. It was work, and I remember uh, being, I was a preacher's kid, by the way, and so there was a lot of, a lot of people zoning in and saying, you know, I should look a certain way, I should do a certain thing. So church very quickly came for me like a, just a religious do's and don'ts. I had to, had to show up and put my, my right over my left and stand just right and smile and sing the right song and, and say hallelujah occasionally, say get one amen in the middle so that they knew I was there and I was supposed to be there. Y'all are laughing right now because some of y'all are thinking, when am I going to get mine in? You can get it in right now, okay? 
Church to me became this religious, hierarchical, rules-based environment because I fell into the trap. It's what the enemy wants you to do. If he can't keep you from God, he wants to get you in religion rather than an actual relationship with Jesus. So you'll be in an environment but still not get what God always wanted you to have. Y'all hearing this today, right? So you have a form of godliness but you deny the power of God because you're doing it in a religious way rather than a heartfelt way. This was me, and so uh, with all of my siblings, there were six of us. Uh, uh, I uh, had an older brother that was the first to kind of to be rebellious, right? He was the first to kind of go outside the lines. Anybody remember the old school Walkmans you used to wear on your side? Young people, you're going to have to Google this later, okay? Like you used to, you used to like put a cassette tape on your side, and, and then we progressed, and we had CDs on your side, but CDs were worse than cassette tapes because if you walk funny, they would start skipping in the middle, right? <laughs> Y'all remember when you used to have to kind of like walk, so, and like you, 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 had, you couldn't go jogging with a CD player on your side. <laughs> One day my brother was rocking out. Anybody still love rock and roll around here? Is that okay? I mean, I still... I, at like 14 and 15, I got introduced to like classic rock and roll, Foreigner, Journey. Come on, it's good stuff. Some of y'all getting quiet again. <laughs> I know you listened to something on the way here today. <laughs> Listen, even Journey has a Christian song. Don't stop <laughs> believing. <laughs> My brother wasn't listening to Journey. He had Metallica on. In our day, that was like the devil's music, Metallica. I won't sing you any of the words because you'll probably lose respect for me because I know way too many of the songs. <laughs> he was just rocking out, and I remember my mom was walked up and, and grabbed the headphones. What are you listening to? And Metallica. Next thing you know, that Walkman was on the ground. And it was like smashed to pieces, and it was a highly religious moment. Y'all following this? Can I just say, I dare say it was life-sucking? <laughs> My parents are here today, and they're really quiet right now. <laughs> they are not those people any longer. They found Jesus. They helped me to find Jesus and fall in love with Jesus. But all of us, when you're introduced to this, the first thing you see is what everybody else is doing, and I just need to look like everybody else, and I need to go through the motions, and I need to just do all the things, and you start out being a hypocrite, and that's not what God wants. How about you be you? Be real, be honest, and become like Christ. We all have the tendency to go through the motions. And, and I remember that. I was like, man, I, 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 I'm going to listen to that music, but I'm never going to listen to it around my mom. Y'all hearing this today. So what did I do? It, it didn't cause me to change. It caused me to hide. You know what religion does? It doesn't help you change. It causes you to hide. Right now we have, we have religious people all over the world calling themselves something that they are actually not. You fast forward a little bit, I found Jesus, started following Jesus, became a youth pastor, and, and uh, my mentor and pastor who, who pastors in Birmingham, Alabama, he had planted a church there, and I began to study and learn under him, and, and I just, I saw this life-giving idea, I saw something different, and so I asked him if we could uh, get a job there to move there, and their church was a new church plant, he said, I don't have a job for you, but if you move here, I'll be your friend. My wife and I decided that we would resign working here. As a, we had been working as youth pastors for seven years. We, resigned, we left our home, New Orleans, and moved to Birmingham, Alabama for, for no job, no commitment. We risked everything simply because what I saw exampled in church was so life-giving. I said, I've got to do that. My first weekend there... I went and sat down with him because he said he'd be my friend if I showed up. And so I set my first friend meeting with him. And I, I went to his office and we started talking. I said, Pastor Chris, I just want you to know that I'm here to submit my life to you. Because I came from a religious, hierarchical, controlling environment of people. And I, I need to submit my life to them. And he looked at me. He said, Josh, I know where you're coming from. But the day your heart leaves, I'm going to help you get where God is calling you. I'm going to help you get where, where your heart wants to be. And I said, no, no, Pastor Chris, you don't understand. You don't understand, I'm here to submit my life to you. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't want to control you. And I don't want to put you in a box. 
One day, if your heart leads you to go back to New Orleans as I plant a church, I'm going to be your best friend then too. I left that meeting and I drove uh, home to my wife and I, I got out of the car and she said, well, how'd it go? And I said, well, I think we made a mistake. <laughs> this guy doesn't understand authority. He doesn't understand, you know, he doesn't understand control. He doesn't understand religion. That's not what I said, but he, I just, he doesn't understand. And for years I had been reading one particular version of the Bible because that was the version of the Bible. We didn't read those other versions. Because there's this one version, that's, that's God's version. Can I just tell you that the original Hebrew and Greek can, can change, has not changed, and it will never change. But as we interpret that to English, sometimes it helps to get some words that make sense to you. I'm a fan of the King James Version of the Bible, but whither thou goest never helps me understand that we need to go that direction. <laughs> so... When I got there, they were reading the NIV 1984 translation. And where I came from, the NIV was considered the nearly inspired version of Scripture. <laughs> that next morning after the meeting that I left and I said, we must have made a mistake. I was reading Psalm 119 in NIV 84, and here's what it said. They're going to put it on screen. It said, I run in the path of your commands. For you have set my heart free. And all I can tell you is that the words lifted off the page to me. And what I left with is I don't have to do this, I get to do it. I don't have to go to heaven, I get to go to heaven. I don't have to go to church, I get to be a part of a family. I don't have to serve, I get to make a difference with my life. Everything shifted. It's become a life verse for me. Even though we don't read NIV 84 around here very much. I run in the path of your commands. I look like Jesus. Because you set my heart free to do it. You don't have to do what I do. You don't have to do it the way that I do it. You can read your Bible and be authentic and go after God. What does it look like? Would you write it down with me? I want to contrast the first five. Here's the first. If we look at Jesus, Jesus is authentic. What you see is what you get with Jesus. When he walked in at 12 and he was blowing the minds of the scholars and his parents were wondering where he was at, I kind of liked Jesus' kind of type A personality in that moment. His parents were like, where have you been? He said, wouldn't you know that I would be about my father's business at 12, right? I kind of love that, that even Jesus said, anybody got a 12-year-old that will tell you something like they know it, right? <laughs> my kids still think they know everything better than me. And yet recently they started coming to me for like, should I wear this or should I not? I'm like, that's right, I'm cooler than y'all are. <laughs> Jesus is authentic. The way we say it around here, we say authenticity trumps perfection. You don't have to pretend it, you don't have to fake it, you don't have to kind of work your way through. No, no, Jesus is authentic. You can say, this is right where I am. Listen, I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm, I'm getting better little by little. I'm growing in the likeness of God. You, There is space for you here because this is not religion. This is the house of God. We are, we're focusing on following Jesus. Romans 15 and 3 says it this way. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. I looked, I took on the troubles of the trouble, it says. That's the way scripture puts it. Jesus knows right where you are. And instead of pretending it was easy to go to the cross, he was authentic. You know, he could have left the Garden of Gethsemane out of scripture, but instead he left his experience where he said to God, is there any other way to save all these people? Yet not my will, but your will be done. Do you see the humanity of Jesus? Do you see his authenticity, his willingness to say, no, no, I'm not going to pretend this is easy. Going to the cross isn't what anyone wants to do. But if I do it, it will change everything for the world. Jesus is authentic. Write down the second with me. Jesus is also relevant to our lives now. If you're a young person in the room and you're thinking, what, how, how does this make sense for me? What, how, can I just tell you? Everything written in the Bible is still relevant to you today. 
Romans 15 and 4 describes it this way. It says, even if it was written in Scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in Scripture to come to characterize us keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. The Bible is still relevant to you today. But I hope you all appreciate that, that though in Jesus' day, sheep and goats were really, really popular. How many of y'all are thankful I didn't bring any sheep and goats in today, right? I took y'all to Star Wars and the Mandalorian. Come on, y'all got to go with me on that one, right? Keeping you at least in something that's happening now. A lot of us would have said, in earlier days that our goal in preaching, I used to say this when I was a youth pastor, my goal was to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. But what I didn't realize is that I was acting like what I was teaching was, was a cookie. Can I just tell you today's message is not a cookie, it's steak. It's meat and potatoes. It's easy to understand, but living an authentic and relevant life is pretty challenging. Jesus is authentic and relevant to our lives. Here's my third and most favorite of the five. Jesus is enjoyable. Does anybody here like to laugh? As soon as I say it, it just makes you smile because you're hoping pastor's going to have a good joke for you, and I do. A church member was in front of me coming out of church one day, and the preacher was standing at the door, as all preachers do, to shake hands and he grabbed the member by the hand and pulled him aside, and the pastor said to him, you need to, you need to join the army of the Lord. Kind of sounds like something I would hear in religious, and you need to join the army of the Lord. And the member replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, pastor. And the pastor questioned, how come, how come if you're in the army, I don't see you except at Christmas and Easter? And he whispered back, I'm in the secret service. Listen, Jesus is enjoyable. He isn't a Debbie Downer. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen, everybody? We can take, as I love to say, the, the Mary Poppins way, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Jesus is authentic. Jesus is relevant. Jesus is enjoyable to our lives. Listen to how the scriptures describe him in Romans chapter 15 and verse 5. It says, may our dependably steady and warm personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we'll be a choir, not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony together. We'll get along with each other. What would it be like if the church just actually got along with one another? Verse 24 says, I hope to see you while passing through and that and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have, say it with me, after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Friday night, can I just tell you, I, I got to the point, my team thought, hey, they put everything in the car, they're like, you ready to go? I just was having so much fun. I just discovered that when you come to this with the right heart, you get to enjoy it at a whole new level. If I'm honest with you, some days it's, it's easy for me to slip into a religious mindset. But I work really, really hard to stay close to Jesus because I don't want to do this because I have to. I want to keep doing it because I get to. I've got two more for you. Okay, if you'll come join me, write these two more for me. Here's the fourth. Jesus is accepting. Make sure that you write down the right word because I didn't say always approving. Every parent in here knows the difference in acceptance and approval. You love your child even when they do the wrong thing. You accept them even when they do the wrong thing. But you also going to, come on, you're going to explain it to them that they got to stop doing the wrong thing. Amen, everybody? My parents were really good at explaining it to us. Romans 15 and 7 says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you that's what we're supposed to do we're supposed to accept one another right where we are the bible doesn't say that he's going to leave you there he's going to accept you right where you are but because he loves you he's going to help you to get out of that kind he's going to help you to grow this is the way 
This is what life really looks like. Romans 15 and 7. It's a long passage. I hope you've noticed I've been in one chapter for these five. And the message translation, Romans 15 and 7 says, So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it, and now you do it. Jesus, staying true to God's purposes, reached out in a special way to the Jewish insiders so that the old ancestral promises would come true for them. And then as a result, the non-Jewish outsiders have been able to experience mercy and to show appreciation to God. What is he saying? He's saying they didn't allow it to stay just for the Jewish people, that God expanded it for all people. Just think of all the scriptures that will come true and what we do. For instance, then I'll join outsiders in a hymn. I'll sing to your name. And this one, outsiders and insiders rejoice together. And again, people of all nations celebrate God. Would you read it with me? Every voice, come on. All colors and races give hearty praise to God. Regardless of your history, your heritage, or the color of your skin, we are all made in the image of God, and this is what heaven's going to look like. Jesus is authentic. Jesus is relevant. Jesus is enjoyable. Jesus is accepting. Here's the fifth. Jesus is powerful. If religion is weak, Jesus is where everything really happens. Jesus can still hear you heal your marriage. Jesus can still do a miracle in your life. Jesus still can do those things. You just got to sidestep the religion and lean in to Jesus. Romans 15 and 19 says they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit. Romans 15 and 13 says it this way. It says, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy May he fill you up with peace so that your believing lives filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit will brim over with hope. Today as we close, I would suspect that every one of us here has an area where we need God's power to show up. As we close in every location, would you bow with me for a moment of reflection and prayer? Here's here's what I want you to reflect on. Just for a moment, could it be that you've been focused more on religion than Jesus? Could it be that the area of weakness in your life where you need the power of God, that you've just been going through the motions and doing what religion says to do? And if that's you today, I want to help you to connect to Jesus in a very real and life-giving way. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand. I will not ask you to come to the front. But if you're here today and say, Pastor, I I need Jesus like this. I've tried religion or I've not tried religion. I've been, I've never even heard something like this. If that's you, would you just honestly whisper this prayer? Say these words to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.